the bypasses, etc. And eventually we managed to get what is known as the lorry route. It may not be perfect, but it takes about 98% of the lorries out. And we now get the occasional one stuck. Some good drivers get straight through. But believe me, it is considerably, considerably better than it was when they all, the 40 ton lorries, had to come straight through the town. Now Mike's told me I've only got 10 minutes, so I better get a move on, but hey ho, there's such a lot that goes on in this little town. There were more household shops like butchers, bakers, fresh fruit and veg, two or maybe three electrical store outlets, cards, canes, and of course in the high street we had southern electricity. People were buying ready cut bread, and so people like my father Hazelman's and Mr. Knight, they stopped eventually baking because um, people's tastes had changed and they decided to go in for all this old processed stuff <laughs> that you'd have to buy. So, but the grocers and the coal man, and of course the butchers and the post office, which came twice a day in those days, um, they all delivered to our houses when we lived in the villages that surround the town. It wasn't all just going into the shops where everybody knew everybody. So basically, a cardo, I'm sorry, it's nothing new to have your groceries <laughs> delivered. It was going on in Petworth and every other town that I know locally, long before ever there were Ocados and Sainsbury's and that delivery. Shops change, but we still have Austin's, although it is bigger than it used to be, and that's not a bad thing. And the local saying is, can't get in in Austin's, you don't need it. <laughs> and pellets, not only sweets and tobacco, but clay pipes, of which of course I can have to confess that I often did buy a clay pipe when we were young teenagers in the town dancing <laughs> through the streets. And that's another thing, dancing through the streets. It must be that I've perhaps I've got old, I don't know. But there were no hills in Petworth when I was young. <laughs> <laughs> Some so-and-so has stuck them in, so I'm going to blame the town council. I'll blame them for a few um, No Fairfield surgery in 74. You went up the cobbles to what is now called Pet Petipus, and you spoke to a receptionist. And once you'd spoken to the receptionist, you sat and waited and waited. But everybody had a good chance to have a good old chat, as we still do, I suppose, when there's people we know within the surgery, we stick there. Through this time, we proudly had Petworth Town Band. In fact, we've had it for 175 years, and I think that's absolutely great to have a, a wonderful town band for us. And also, we didn't have a town crier. But I do know, and Miles will correct me if I didn't say this, we had had town criers in the past, hadn't we, Miles? You know, you know more about that than I do. We didn't have an industrial estate, if you all know where the industrial estate is now. And I remember on Petworth Rural District Council sitting with one of the Pellet brothers, there were two brothers that ran pellets, um, the sweet shop and the tobacconists, and he said, what a daft idea to put an industrial estate down at Hampers Green. It gets more fog there than anywhere else. <laughs> <laughs> However, we have it and we seem to be surviving and sort of thriving. 1977 was Jubilee year and the then parish council introduced a fence along the walk, always known to all Petworthians as Round the Hills, not the Jubilee Walk. It was never the Jubilee <laughs> Walk. And what is more, before they put a fence up there, in, when we had snow in the winters, which we don't have much snow now, but when we had snow in the winters, I can remember seeing families like the Cook family, who was one of the vets in the town, actually skiing down there. But of course, fences do put a stop to all of that. Um, but it is, don't forget everybody, round the hills, not Jubilee, as is the yes, on Barton's on these miles. <laughs> of course, there have been many changes in 50 years, and many, many of us still deeply regret the loss of their swimming pool, built for us by Sylvia Beaufoy herself. She did a wonderful thing for the town and for the youth. I seem to remember that Petworth, run by her, had at least two youth clubs. One in the Iron Room, I do remember. Then she bought the old cinema, and we had one there long before the one that's there now, which is doing very well if nobody's been up there to see. It really is a, an absolute um, wonderful facility for the youngsters. I've forgotten the 
Terry, what, how many, um, are there, is there 500 and something registered young Both people? people. It's it's, yeah, it's quite, it's, I mean, so it does really provide an awful lot to some of the young people. But the worst thing of all was the loss of our swimming pool. Um, many of us used to use it, uh, even when my children, our children were little, we had picnics, it was an outdoor pool. So then we thought, right, let's see if we can get another one. Bless Chichester District Council, they actually gave us three million pounds to build one. The only problem was we couldn't find a, so a site for it and we couldn't run it if we built it because it was gonna cost in those days something like 70 or 80,000 pounds a year to run because they insisted that it was a building. Now Petworth didn't have a building, we had an open air pool, we weren't that soft. <laughs> <laughs> and bas but basically that did mean that there was three million pounds sitting there that wasn't going to build us a pool. However, we managed to get that money into the community and they could all bid for it. You might not believe this because we're going back to the late 1990s but there is still some 70 odd thousand to build a skate park <laughs> sitting in a budget somewhere in Chichester District Council and no, they're not going to give us the interest that it's earned. Okay. <laughs> there you go. Um, but again, it's the same old problem, finding a site for it. So what's going to happen eventually? That I really can't tell you. Um, however, what I will tell you is the three million or the net, let's say two and a half million or a little bit more, actually got used by many organisations in the town. The Rifle Club had about 40,000. The um, Petworth Sports Pavilion had similar amounts. The Tennis Club introduced hard tennis courts as well as the grass courts and did improvements to their uh, clubhouse. And the Bowling Club, my goodness, they went all the way from to Australia to order um, artificial grass, which didn't go down a bundle with everybody, I have to say. <laughs> However, it did mean that um, they could actually play on it most of, most of the time. So it did do something, and um, a lot of organisations, not just in Petworth, I hasten to add, the villages around that used to use a swimming pool as well. Now, I don't know if anyone else remembers, Graham and Chris might, might well remember, but we even had a little swimming pool in Midhurst at the grammar school where I actually yes. remember it. I, and yeah, I actually got my swimming certificate there for the length. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that's gone as well. So, you know, swimming pools are us is not here anymore, which is, is great shame. But there you are. That's, that's what they call progress, I suppose. Right? Um, now, 50 years of the Petwood Society. And my goodness, how lucky we are. No politics, no interference in planning, but just great meetings and works with friends and entertainment. And over the years, I can't name them all, but we've had some fantastic entertainment on this stage here and, and before, before that, I think. Um, as again, Miles will be able to tell you an awful lot more about that. And there are many changes. And one, many of us still, oh, well, that was the swimming pool, I beg your pardon. The changes in the 50 years have been quite considerable, as I guess most places are. But we're still a good community. We've still got a lot of community spirits. And when last year with Lord Egremont and another group of people, we had the pleasure of working at Fox Off Bags um, to, to celebrate the coronation, my goodness, everybody turned out. So there's still a big community spirit here. The Christmas event that the town council and others working with them put on for us, there's still a lot going on. People say, what do you do in the country? Well, <laughs> <laughs> could I please have a few more extra hours in the day? But anyway, if there's anything that I've missed out, Miles, you'll fill them in. Um, and if anybody wants to ask me anything when we're around, or if, I, I don't know what you want to do, Mike. <laughs> well, why not have a formal question session at the end? At the end, that's, that'd be good. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. been this great entity in the middle of the town, Petworth House, and there's also been the Leckenfield Estate. 
I can claim that my family has been here since the 12th century. I said that once to somebody who didn't particularly like me. And he said, you've lived here, your family's lived there all those years. That explains why you're so boring. <laughs> it is, in fact, a story of a shrinking entity. In 1883, I take this from a book by Bateman called Great Landowners of Great Britain. In 1883, Henry Leckenfield, my great-grandfather, had an estate of 30,221 acres in West Sussex. He also had land in Yorkshire, Cumberland, and Ireland. In 1952, my father, who inherited from his uncle, Charles Leckenfield, inherited 28,000 acres. In 1972, when my father died, I inherited 18,000 acres, and now in 2024, it's down to 13,500. One might think that that's much too much, and of course, in a way, it is. And there have been examples of my family's, perhaps one might describe it as generosity, not enough, perhaps. Charles Leckenfield gave Scarfell and Great Gable in Cumberland to Great Fells, um, which they, which up there they call mountains, to the nation as a memorial to the dead of the First World War. And in 1947, my great uncle gave Petworth House and Park to the National Trust. I grew up in Petworth. I was born in 1948. I lived in London for the first four or five years of my life, and then we moved down first to New Grove and lived there for about two years, and then we moved into Petworth House. I was very conscious then that the basis of the estate was farming, was agriculture. And in 1969, at my 21st birthday celebrations, 50 tenants sat down uh, for a dinner. In 2024, there are 25 tenants, so it's half the number that there was when I was 21. And of course, the nature of agriculture around here has changed immensely. When I grew up, there were a lot of small dairy farms, perhaps milking 20 to 30 cattle at the most, bringing the milk in churns down to a stall, to a wooden stand at the bottom of the drive where the lorry from the milk marketing board would collect it every day. Now, the, there are only two dairy farms <coughs> left, and the farming is mostly corn, sheep, and cattle. There's been a huge change in the way that my family can behave themselves as well. <laughs> Charles Leckenfield, my great uncle, was really like a feudal baron. He had astonishing freedom. There was no planning. There were no employment laws. He was chairman of the county council. And hunting was his great pursuit. And he once did something which I could never possibly do today. During the Second World War, he was out hunting with his hounds. And they ran into a football match, probably in the park. And he was very angry about this. And he stood up in his stirrups and said, haven't you people got anything better to do than <laughs> play football? <laughs> Just imagine if I did that. <laughs> imagine if I rode my horse through the middle of a football match or a cricket field and shouted at them and said, haven't you people got anything better to do than play cricket or football? I'd be taken out into the square and lynched. <laughs> That's a great change that's happened. And it happened really after my father inherited in 1952. A real landmark was the Town and Country Planning Act, I think of 1947 or 1948, when you had to have consent to build or to do development on your land. Before that, you could do whatever you wanted. And of course, the town in those years, I, I'm, I'm are we the same age, Janet? 
I'm a bit older than you, well, sorry. Yeah, you <laughs> you certainly don't look it. I, I feel I've known you all my life anyway. Most, most uh, of the time. But when I was growing up here, really, Petworth was an agricultural community. There was the, uh, the people in the big house, there were the doctors, there was the bank manager. Most of the rest of the town worked for my family, and of course, agriculture was the main, the main industry. That has really changed. In the 1950s, my father couldn't rent cottages on the estate to people because nobody wanted to come. Nobody wanted to live around Petworth. Nobody wanted to live in West Sussex. It wasn't on the way anywhere. You couldn't commute from here. There was a big house called Slade Land. My father said to me, I think we're going to be able to let it to a comedian called Jimmy Edwards, <laughs> who played polo at Cowdery, and therefore he was interested. He decided, no, he didn't want it, so my father knocked it down. <laughs> think what it would be worth today. It's inconceivable. And then, very sadly, my father died in 1972 when he was only 52. I'm not complaining at all about paying taxes. I think it's ridiculous for rich people like myself to complain about that. But we have had two very big doses of what are sometimes called death duties. In 1952, when my great uncle died, and in 1972, when my father died. In 1972, I was 24. I was working in London for a publishing firm. I had no training whatsoever in farming or land management. I remember my father saying, and he was absolutely right, if he'd lived his normal lifespan, he said, there's no point in you going to Sarancester or going to an agricultural college, because by the time I, I die, and my, and my family are usually long lived, uh, everything that you learn will be out of date. <coughs> Two years later, he died. And of course, I knew nothing. I came down here, and one of the first big challenges I had to confront was the question of the Petworth bypass. <coughs> Janet's already mentioned that. There were two possible routes at that stage, one through the park, one through the Shimmings Valley. Both, of course, were simply dreadful. They wouldn't be considered today. It, it shows how in it local government was in those days, that they should present these two alternatives. I remember going at the time to the county council headquarters in Chichester and being taken to the county council's landscape department, a vast building full of these people plotting to put roads through parks and through beautiful parts of the county. <laughs> Of course, they got it completely wrong. It was solved by one man, Bert Speed, the butcher. <laughs> Do you remember him, Janet? <laughs> he was a terrific chap. He solved the whole thing. The county council got it completely wrong. But we should remember that the Petworth Society was founded in opposition to the road going through the Shimmings Valley and in support of the road going through the park. <laughs> and who was the major hate figure? Me. <laughs> I was loathed in the town. I scarcely dared go to the chemist because I feared the Petworth Society, the two people that ran the Petworth Society early on, a very, very nice man was the first chairman called Colonel Maud. And he was delightful and he was my friend. I looked upon him as my friend. Colonel Moore told me that his major claim to fame was that he had worked on the Times in the 1950s and there had been a competition to con con concoct the dullest headline. <laughs> he won it. <laughs> and the headline was Small Earthquake in Chile. <laughs> Colonel Moore was my friend. My enemy was the vice president, Sir Leslie Fry. <laughs> Does anybody remember him? Yes. yes. My goodness, how he hated me. <laughs> He'd been the ambassador in Brazil. He'd been the ambassador in Indonesia. 
And one of the major problems was that my parents had never invited him to lunch or dinner. <laughs> and he set to work to campaign to put the road through the park. And I thought, well, in the end, this is sure to run out of steam. He was quite elderly. It was quite clear early on that Lady Fry's best friend was the gin bottle. <laughs> so I thought this might, in the end, tell. And sure enough, the last thing that really sent them on their way and sent them out of Petworth, there was a troop of Balinese dancers <laughs> traveling around England performing in places like Wigan and Halifax and that sort of place. And so Leslie Fry said, I think I can get them to come to Petra. And I thought, mm. I said to Sir Leslie, oh, yes, please, do get them down here. That'd be wonderful. So I thought, this is going to So he put up a huge notice saying, Balinese dancers, Leckenville Hall, 7.30, Saturday. <laughs> Nobody came. <laughs> <laughs> Leslie left very soon with his wife and helped her into the car. They drove off to Eastbourne and were never seen again. <laughs> I saw his obituary in the Times. I remember thinking, well, I could have added a paragraph or two. <laughs> but my goodness, how lucky we were about what happened next. I mean, one of my heroes is Peter Jerome. Absolutely. What a terrible sadness this is, he's not here yes. tonight. We owe Peter so much. He transformed the Petra Society from a pressure group, a narrow pressure group, <coughs> that created rather an unpleasant atmosphere in the town, to the best sort of local history society. And it makes me very proud, and I'm sure it makes Janet proud, and everyone else who's been involved in that, that it's lasted now for 50 years. Yes. May it go on for another 50 years, yes. and may Peter continue to give us his wisdom and his good advice, and how sad we are that he's not with us this evening. Yes. I've never been invited to lunch at Petra. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't bear a grudge. I know it's too late now. Right? <laughs> um, I don't know whether you've been, I, I'm sure you've all been watching this while I've been yes. asleep. No. Um, <laughs> And there he is, look. Yes. What timing, there you That's are. Right. Yeah. And me, please. That's what I said. And That's what I said. Um, Miles Costello. Miles yeah. with my papers, I say. Um, I just want to mention these. Um, we've got dozens and dozens of posters, pet society posters, all done by hand by Keith over the years. Mm. A brilliant, a fantastic record for the pet society. <laughs> I must say that the last time we had an absolutely packed Leckenfield Hall with a hundred people in it was when a young lady came who had a previous life as a playboy. <laughs> and tell, probably tells you something about the yeah. society, the type, the type of audience we had. And that was back in 1980 something, I believe. Right. Well, I'm hope, I hope you're enjoying the slideshow anyway. Yes. Yes. Um, I could have got produced hundreds and hundreds like this, but uh, just a few, a select few. Right, I'm just going to say a few brief words about the very early years of the society, how it began and what happened in the formative years. Now, I thought I could waffle upon about anything, there'd be nobody here to correct me, which was something that Peter used to tell me, always worked. Just say anything, nobody knows. <laughs> Unfortunately, David Snell is here, who was one of the earliest, well, he was among the earliest members of the society. So, Could you please speak up? Sorry, I thought I've been quite loud. <laughs> uh, I've had a cold, so you'll have to forgive me. Right. How many of you here know the name Maud, Colonel Maud? 
for yeah. the Pitman Mills. Right. Not Francis Maud, no. Colonel Allen Maud. Right. As Lord Egremont said, he worked for the Times for a number of years. He was a uh, previous life, he'd been a military man, obviously by the, uh, the Colonel. And um, for years he'd had an interest in Petworth. He lived at Stone House up in the High Street. And he'd often wondered how he could move his interest on. And it was a period when local civic societies were starting to come into their own. And he wrote a letter to the, ta uh, to the local paper. I'm not sure whether it was the Midhurst Times or whatever. And um, just flying a kite, basically, in the hope that he'd get some reaction. Because there'd been nothing around the town. Nobody had really shown any interest. And um, that was in the autumn of 1973. A lengthy letter, he outlined his proposal and concluded it by stating that he had reason to believe that many residents would welcome the formation of such a society, which should be entirely non-political, non-sectarian and non-profit making. I'm reading this from the letter. Its main objects would be to protect the character, interests and amenities of our ancient town and parish, including Byworth and Eggdean to promote a community spirit and to link between its various activities and generations. In cooperation with the Public Library and the County Record Office, the Society could do much to preserve and make accessible various items of local interest, which too often disappear on the death or removal of their owners. And so, unintentionally, Colonel Maud had in the letter to the newspaper outlined the future and governing the constitution of the society before it was even born. The response to his letter encouraged him to take the next step and a public meeting was arranged for December of 1973 where it was agreed to create a steering group to investigate the possibility of forming a society. The group met on the 15th of March 1974 exactly 50 years ago today. This was followed a few weeks later by the first committee meeting, which was held on 4th of April in the public library. Present at this inaugural committee meetings were Mrs. Boss, I'm sure you'll recognise a lot of these names, Messrs. J and R. Davidson, Colonel Moore, Sir Leslie Fry, <laughs> Arthur Hill, who remembers Arthur Hill? <laughs> Wonderful Arthur Hill. Hilton Oaks, Horace Probin, Mrs. M. Sheridan, David Sneller, Miss Streeter, Peter Jerome, Patrick Sims, Lady Shackley, oh sorry, Lady Shackley had sent her apologies. So she never actually made it to the first committee meeting. I don't know whether that continued, but um, of that first committee meeting, only Peter Jerome and David Sneller survived today. I think that's probably right, David, isn't it? Yeah, it's still here, yeah. <laughs> David threw a spanner in the works because I was, wasn't expecting him to be here. You know, I hadn't been told, so I was going to go on about actually there's nobody here that was in that first committee meeting, but he walked through the door and messed my little speech up. <laughs> I'll now read a few random extracts from the early committee meetings. I'm minutes. I'm not going to go on for too long, don't worry. At the second meeting, it was decided that a ladies' committee should be formed. <laughs> which, I'm sure you know, carried on for many, many years. They arranged all the social events, did all the washing up, and they got the <laughs> Some things never change, you know. <laughs> Lady Fry took charge of that. <laughs> the first society, I, I'm going to get Lady, Lord and Lady Fry into this as many times as I can. <laughs> the first society bulletin was issued in May of 1974 and consisted of eight pages. Though by the time of the third bulletin in December it had ris risen to the to 12 pages. A grand total of 12 pages. By early 1974, that doesn't sound right. By early 1975, less than a year after the society was formed, the membership stood at over 200. And Lord Egremont and Keith Thompson, who I'm 
You can't hear me, Keith, can you? You don't like that. Sorry. Who I'm pleased are both with us tonight are joined and committed. The subscription at that time was just 50p a year. The headmaster of the Herbert Shiner School suggested that a juvenile section of the society could be formed in the school. I wonder what happened to it. Obviously, it didn't take off. Did it? Did it? I don't remember it. Ah, oh, right. Okay. Yeah. Like most things. Also in 1974, the idea of building an extension to the public library was suggested. The new building would be for the use of the Pepper Society. Fundraising was to begin immediately, and it was suggested that perhaps members could buy or sponsor individual bricks to raise the necessary funds. A target figure of £4,000 was agreed upon. 1975 was a period of consolidation. Membership stood at 224. Bulletin number 5 was issued. A successful coffee morning held on Petworth Fair Day raised £61 for the society. And in October of that year, the contentious question of a bypass was first raised at committee. It was suggested that the park should be marked out with stakes so that people could see where the proposed route would run. 1976 saw the formation of a... It's all right, I'm not going to go all the way up today, so don't worry about that. 1976 saw the formation of a junior section at St Michael's School in Dunstan. Bob Sneller joined the committee. Uh, Bob. Peter Jerome and Hilton Noakes were elected joint vice chairman of the society. An exhibition of photographs depicting trade in Petworth was displayed in the NatWest Bank that October. Couldn't do that now, could you? <laughs> A party was held for members in the Leckenfield Hall on Fair Day. 1977 saw a contribution of £10 being given to the Petworth Silver Jubilee Committee. Colonel Maud, now 86, stood down as chairman of the society and was immediately elected president. Hilton Oaks replaced Colonel Maud as chairman, while Peter Jerome remained vice chairman with Bob Sneller as treasurer. Am I getting it right, Bob? Yeah. Is that right? Thank you. The estimated cost of the new extension to the public library had now risen to £8,000. It was to be known as a meeting room and to have seating for up to 70 persons. Mr Poppington, the local, local builder, was elected to the committee. A subcommittee was formed to deal with matters concerning the proposed relief run. Late 1978, only one more yet, Lady Shackley asked that a special watch should be kept on the new houses being built <laughs> at the Sheep Downs and to ensure that free access, so I'm looking at you, uh, free access to the Virgin Mary Springs should be maintained. This one for Lord Egremont. It was suggested by Lady Fry <laughs> that the Indonesian Embassy were willing to send a group of dancers to give up performers and display of costumes to the society. <laughs> Only 92 tickets, I think that's pretty good, uh, having been sold, it was decided to cancel the Indonesian event. In the absence of any financial assistance from West Sussex County Council, it was decided to put the library extension on hold. Hilton Oaks resigned as chairman as he was leaving Petworth. Peter Jerome was elected chairman, with Keith Thompson vice chair. The library extension was abandoned completely due to the high cost of borrowing. I think we all remember that, 1978. The chairman suggested that Mrs. Ann Simmons, who sadly can't be with us, and Jumbo Taylor be co opted onto the committee. As long as he didn't attend meetings. <laughs> Jumbo, yes, 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 yes. I think that's something you shared with Lord Egremont, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> That's, that, that, that's something to think about, how much Lord Egremont and Jumbo had in common. <laughs> well, it's... <laughs> 1979. Information has been received that outline planning permission has been given for the construction of three properties on the site of Petworth Railway Station. Bearing in mind that we had a subcommittee that used to keep an eye on planning applications. 
and for the building to be removed and reconstructed at a Railway Preservation Society property in the West Country. The society stated in the minutes that they hoped that the building would remain at Petworth and an alternative use could be found for it. Well, you know it did stay. The latest printing run of the bulletin was to be increased from 400 to 600, this is 1979, in order to satisfy demand. Mr Jerome added that issue number 15 had been well received and that all surplus copies had been sold. The Society's President and founding Chairman, Colonel Alan Ward, paid, passed away on June 6, 1979, at the age of 89. And the rest is history. Okay. Thank you all three. Um, there's some other thanks as well. Um, after we finish questions, which I'm sure you're all looking forward to, um, we've got a cake cutting, and I owe Janet, yes, uh, thanks uh, again for baking the cake. Thank you for everyone for helping with the, with the um, food, which was fabulous. So, are there any questions for our very, very knowledgeable panel here? I might get away with it, yeah. <laughs> yes. How many members are there today? There are... Um, Interestingly, we, we picked up about 15 or so new members, so we're at about 320, something like that. The scariest thing, actually, is our Facebook membership is almost greater than our real membership. No, no, no. Now, we've had, to, we've had to say to Facebook members, you're not a member, really. You know, you, you don't get, if you want to become a member, you have to join. Um, and, and so that, that, that's that's going to be something for the future, I suppose. But yes, um, nowhere near the 600 magazines or anything like that we need to print. There were almost a thousand that were just before the millennium. Um, but COVID had a huge effect on membership. We, Peter and I could see that right from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. um, membership was good. Everybody's way of doing anything changed, didn't it? Um, yeah. You know, you get people out now to get, just to get people to join any society nowadays is extremely difficult. And, but it's still probably one of the most successful local societies in in the south of England. Yeah. You know, mm. if you consider the size of the town, I think I'd say that, wouldn't you? Yeah. yeah. But of course, it's different. People are different now. Yes. I mean, when when the society in the in the seventies, the eighties, and the nineties. Members of the society have been born locally, they had their families here. Um, it went through a period where it was very um, considered to be rather elitist in the 70s and early 80s. We could see that by the, by the committee, uh, Lady, Lady, uh, Lady Fry and people like that, you know. Um, it, it didn't give a good, good impression. All right, there was David, I know. But <laughs> <laughs> certainly not elitist. But, but, um, yeah, but, but it changed gradually. The, the committee changed. People like well, um, Julia and Judith went on to the committee, and, and it almost ran from families. I mean, parents, both your parents were on the committee as well. You know, so, but I think times have changed. And may I say, as the uh, most old fashioned person here in terms of my role, that perhaps you should actually celebrate the fact that you have a large Facebook follower. Yeah. Um, and that perhaps there needs to be a different form of membership, that perhaps is the way forward in the future, because that is the way that lots of things are moving. You see what I mean? Yeah. But it's, 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 it's rather interesting that of our members, we asked them if we could have their email addresses because we could then market the events through emails, and only 50% of our members have email addresses. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. But, but some of them do, and we'll then pass it on to others, you see. If you consider that Sarah's probably the youngest person in the world, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure what that's. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Any more I'm the second youngest. <laughs> no. Okay. Well, if there are no more questions, oh yes, there are questions. Good. Though. It's Michael. not really a question. It's just for on behalf of a number of floating supporters, the value that all the work you do 
and had historically done with the Pepper Festival, the Pepper Society, is fantastic and is greatly, greatly appreciated. I mean, on behalf of all of us who are not regular people here, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. is in charge of our events and I think our next one is on the next event well we've got the AGM of course we've got the AGM and we have a very very well known speaker in Ian Yong <laughs> um, we have I, I, it's interesting that the society we've gone for 50 years and we seem to have the same constitution that Colonel Maud put together more or less funnily enough we lost a thing somewhere and now Lexi we got it back they were, I, I don't know where it disappeared out of the Constitution. But. Well, the Constitution is quite easy because it, it doesn't mention we're a charity, which is a bit of a, a, bit of a problem because we're actually with the Charity Commission and we are a charity, obviously. Uh, but there are things like that that we have to, we, we're going to change. And that's going to not be at this AGM because I think it's too fundamental to actually spring on our members. Um, but we will start suggesting at the AGM about some of the ideas that we have. Um, we've also managed to secure. Um, a tour of the tunnels under Pepper Powers. Oh, um, unfortunately, um, we have to wait till the bats have gone. That's right. Um, and only 10 people at time, 12 people at time um, uh, are, willing, are able to do it. But we might be able to get two on the same day. So that's quite exciting. That's good. Uh, a tour around the, the, the pleasure gardens um, and archaeological walks, I think. Mm -hmm. And a history walk. And a history and a town walk. So we've got the summer planned out. We've also got um, a few things going on in, in the autumn as well. So I hope to see at our next event a hundred people there as well. <laughs> okay, the next event is actually the Ebeno Common Walk. Oh, of course, miles. I, I, we are advertising that. It's the, absolutely. It's the Petworth Park yeah. and Petworth Society joint Ebeno Common Walk on. Said that. Hey, well done. <laughs> <laughs> April the 28th, and um, cars will leave the car park. And the cars will leave Pepper Car Park at 2.15. All meet at the church. All meet at Ebeno Church. Yeah. Okay. And yeah, will, will people there all be upset when 100 people turn up for no. They will be delighted because we're going to be having tea and coffee in Ebeno Church afterwards, <laughs> and they're catering for 100. Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully the nightingales will be singing by then. They usually are from April 15. Keith. I was just reminded. Well, the first town walk attracted 70 people. Oh, oh, God. And you can imagine what that was like. Getting yeah, people yeah. round the table. The other thing that didn't seem to crop up, I may be wrong, was the part David took, David Speller took, in reviving Petworth Fair. I mean, the, the impetus from that was the previous year, the uh, fair consisted of one children's round. And then everybody came together and it, the first uh, revival day was tremendous. Yeah. But I only went up to 1979, that's why. But the first fair was 1985 or 4. Yeah. The, first, the first Petworth Society fair. David, yeah. I've brought you up there. Any other business? Well, that's right. it, it's still going. Um, yeah. It's changed. It's, and, I've and got a copy of his book, Petworth Fair. Yeah. And he signed it to David for how true the fair would no longer exist. Wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's true. It's very likely true. Yeah. But um, at the last fair, um, Miles Costello said to me, This is the last one I do. And I don't believe him. It is. No, I don't believe you. <laughs> no, I don't believe you. It is. So I've been assured of Miles. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, um, thank you all yeah, for, for coming along. Thank you, Josh.